and welcome on this, the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today we hear the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector in today's Gospel. As we listen, we are invited to consider these words with fresh hearts and ponder the message so that we may go home justified. Our Mass this evening is being offered for the repose of the souls of Jeffrey Chaucer, Dolores Cullen, and David Seha. We'll be your music song leaders this evening. We are Musica Ficta, together with uh, singers and musicians from OLA and the surrounding area. We are having some PowerPoint challenges, so please be patient and hopefully we'll get something going for you. The presider of our liturgy this evening is Father Tom Wilbers. Before we begin, let's observe a few moments in silence to prepare ourselves to join in this Eucharistic celebration. Our entrance song is titled, O Virgos Lindens. Jesus, you call us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you heal our weakness and forgive our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you continue to send your Spirit among us to bring to 
fulfillment of the work you have begun. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase our faith, our hope, and our charity, and make us love what you command, so that we may merit what you promise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Sirach. <clears throat> the Lord is a God of justice, who knows no favorites, though not unduly partial toward the weak, yet he hears the cry of the oppressed. The Lord is not deaf to the wail of the orphan, nor to the widow when she pours out her complaint. The one who serves God willingly is heard his petition reaches the heavens. The prayer of the lowly pierces the clouds. It does not rest till it reaches its goal, nor will it withdraw till the Most High responds. Judges justly and affirms the right, and the Lord will not delay. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to
reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am already being poured out like a libation, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have competed well. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, the crown of righteousness awaits me which the Lord, the just judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearance. At my first offense, no one appeared on my behalf, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me, proclamation might be completed, and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil threat, and will bring me safe to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Pray. 
O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. As I was preparing for the Mass this evening, um, wondering how to tie the Gospel reading in with the life and the meaning of Geoffrey Chaucer, particularly on this occasion that uh, the fervent, faithful disciple of Geoffrey Chaucer, our dear friend Dolores Cullen, has left us and gone home to her reward. What is Jesus trying to tell us right now? dawned on me as I was looking through my favorite source of quick reference material, Wikipedia. <laughs> they do have an excellent uh, section on Geoffrey Chaucer. It's a little bit lacking, though, in Chaucer's relationship to Christianity. Maybe I can pull together a little bit of Dolores' writings and, uh, and supplement that, since uh, you know, the peer review for Wikipedia is essentially everybody. And there's a lot of checks and balances to kind of keep the kooks out, hopefully, at least keep them in mind. Anyway, Wikipedia is another subject. Uh, one of the things that dawned on me was that this man, who is universally regarded as the father of English literature, literature in English, that is, from England, in the context of the English world at that time, in the 14th century, that he was not by profession a scholar or a writer. That was probably his hobby, which he engaged in more and more late in life. Uh, now, of course, what do we call people who have a hobby that they're passionate about? We call them amateurs, don't we? And what is an amateur? An amateur is one who does what he or she does out of love. The root of the word amateur is one who loves. I'm not so sure about what that always says about the professionals and the academics and those people, but we do know where the heart of the amateur is. But what was Chaucer's profession? How did he make a living? He identifies himself as a vintner. Now, I looked a little bit deeper and discovered that in London in his day, vintner was not one who made wine, vintner was one who sold wine, or rather was the middleman importing the wine from the places where they grew wine, grew grapes, and made wine, which was not England. They don't have enough sun to get any kind of sugar in the grapes. Uh, so imported wine, and then sold it to the people, to the pubs, and to the various stores that people bought wine from. And 
at the time of Chaucer, vintners, wine merchants, were among the wealthiest of the non-noble class. So he came from a wealthy family, and he was engaged in a wealth in a uh, very profitable trade. He was obviously very, very astute and very intelligent, because early on he was called into public service, and he became what we like to call sometimes, most of the time maybe, unapprovingly, he became a bureaucrat. In fact, his profession was to be a professional bureaucrat. A civil servant working for the government, but of course the government meant the king. And the government meant all of those officials around the king who were answerable to the king. And as a bureaucrat, he did quite a bit of traveling. He became very acquainted with the culture of other countries in, uh, in Europe, all of whom were run by kings, except Parts of Italy were run by the Pope, who was the king of the Papal States. And most of the time, they were fighting with one another. Or they were negotiating peace treaties with one another, trying to always get the advantageous position. And Geoffrey Chaucer was really right in the middle of all of the diplomacy that being a an ambassador, a civil servant, a public servant, a king's servant, a bureaucrat, and tail. He was also a rather pious, devout layman. He knew his religion. But more than that, he knew Jesus Christ. And that is what makes, if you're at all familiar with Dolores Cullen's research, that's what makes her research so very special. Because she very astutely and very rightly, I think, identifies the host of the Canterbury Tales as being Christ. And the various pilgrims represent a lot of things. But one of the things that's most obvious that they represent are the various kinds of people of society, and particularly the various kinds of people of the church. And guess what? None of them are doing what they should be doing. They were all corrupt. That may be one reason why a lot of what uh, Chaucer had to say had to be cloaked in humor and in figures of speech, metaphors, allegory, and so on. Because what he was saying about God and Jesus Christ and the Church was not necessarily um, very pleasing to a lot of people of power. So he had to kind of couch what he was saying uh, in terms that would enable his head to stay connected with his body. And apparently he did that fairly successfully, although there are some theories based on some circumstantial evidence that Chaucer himself may have been murdered. Uh, but be that as it may, he was right in the middle of a lot of controversy. But what he was, was a professional merchant and bureaucrat living in the world 
trying to make his way through the world with some degree of integrity. Because as we all know, and certainly in, in current events, it's pretty obvious that those who deal with the relationships with other countries uh, often do shady deals and uh, things that are not necessarily, well, they're the sort of thing that if they cared about it, they should go to confession for. But that's, guess what? That's the way things were then as well as now. Things tend not to change. So Chaucer, I think in many ways, poured his soul and his heart into this seemingly body mishmash of stories that hid a very deep treasure. Now, in the Gospel, we've got the professional religious guy, the Pharisee. And he knew that he was religious. And by God, he was proud of it. And he didn't hesitate to tell the Lord how much he was doing for God. And when he was finished with his prayer, which was a monologue, no evidence that he was listening to God. He goes home, unchanged. The tax collector was a bureaucrat who most, most of them made liberal use of the opportunities to cheat people in their role as public officials. And what did he do? He stayed off in the court. Basically, he did the equivalent of going to confession. And he simply beat his breast and said, Lord, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And Jesus says, he went home, justified, forgiven. Now, I have to confess, Dolores, that I have not yet managed to read all of the Canterbury Tales in translation, much less in Middle English. But I have read the introduction and the conclusion, which is called the retraction. And the retraction that Chaucer wrote is sort of a, um, it's a plea for his reader to pray for him. That's how he ends the Canterbury Tales. You who are reading this, pray for me. Pray for me to the Lord Jesus, to his Holy Mother, to all the saints and the angels. I mean, he, he really sounded almost desperate that my sins may be forgiven, that whatever I have done wrong may not be held against me, that I may enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's pretty clear that he had a faith that was deep enough and strong enough to publicly ask us more than six centuries later to pray for him. That is what gave Dolores Cullen the idea to on the 600th anniversary of his death, which was October 25th, as in yesterday, October 25th, 2000, 600 years to the day after Chaucer died, uh, she wanted a mass offering for the repose of the soul because that's 
what he asked for. And I suggested, well, why don't we make it a little public thing? Why don't we have some medieval music to go with us? Why don't we have a party afterwards with mead and all kinds of goodies and wine? Actually, I don't know if Chaucer ever actually drank mead because we do know that he was given by one of the kings a bequest, a gift of one gallon of wine per day. Yeah, not too shabby. <laughs> so, you know, he, and apparently he did something to earn that. But at any rate, he, he, uh, uh, he looked back on his life. And I don't know if he looked back on his life as a writer and, oh, you know, I did all of these body things and, uh, and, and wrote about them and all of that and I, I need to ask forgiveness. Or if he recognized that as a bureaucrat at the service of the king, dealing in relationships with all of these other bureaucrats of other kings, trying to sort of bring peace, but more often trying to work towards our benefit rather than your benefit, if that perhaps was something he had to confess and say, I need forgiveness. So it could very well be that the tax collector in Jesus' parable is an image that Chaucer may have had in his mind when he was writing those words interesting thought and an interesting parallel. Now, there's a couple of takeaways. I always like to end a homily. You know that when I get to the takeaways, the end may be there. <laughs> Maybe there. Uh, one of the takeaways is do what you need to do to make your way through this life that means your profession may not always be the thing that you love, but it may be something that you're good at. Don't scorn that. Embrace it. But don't let that get in the way of what you love. And Chaucer obviously loved his language enough to be able to write well and inventively in the spoken and just barely written tongue of, of, of his language. I don't think he ever thought that 600 years later he would be studied and analyzed and uh, regarded as the father of English literature because that was just his hobby. He was just an amateur. But look what happened. Uh, the other takeaway is let's remember, like the, the Pharisee and the tax collector, that we don't get through this life unsullied. We all have plenty of things that we need to say, Lord. So Chaucer is an example, the tax collector in the, in the gospel is an example. I think we need to learn from that example the gift of humble uh, contrition, which frees us then to go forth forgiven. Let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God, born in the Father before all ages, God and God, God, life and life, to God and to God.
we come to God in prayer with humble and trusting hearts, we place our needs before the throne of love. That we, the church, will admit our sinfulness before God and seek forgiveness and reconciliation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who lead nations, communities, and families would choose peace over violence. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That each of us will respond with a generous spirit to God's call to share our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That in our parish and school, we'll continue to boldly speak God's truth in all we humbly say <clears throat> and do. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who await the Lord's gift of healing will find peace and comfort in God's loving care, including Robert Floyd, Jeffrey Briss, Patrick Borman, Mike Bustamante, Maria McNeil, and Jim Woolen. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. May our family and friends who have finished the race will find a crown of righteousness waiting for them, including those we, we remember now in silence, as well as Juanita Jones, Marilyn Bashore, and Marianne Mitchell. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. That the personal prayers of this faith community will be heard and answered including those written in our parish book of intercessions, those held in our hearts, and the special intention of the intentions of this Mass for the repose of the soul of Jeffrey Chaucer and Dolores Cullen and David Seca. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Gracious God, you are merciful to all sinners who cry out to you. Hear these our prayers that we might one day be exalted with you in heaven. Make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Through the divine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Let us pray now that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty God. Almighty uh, look, look, O Lord, we pray on the offerings we make to your majesty, that whatever is done by us in your service may be directed above all to your glory, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dominus Cohopidiscum, et un spiritum tuo, turtum cohorta, omnibus Gracias a Danus Domino Deo nostro, It's truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we have sang.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory. Mysterium Fidei, Morten Tuum, Ancianus Domine, Et Tuum, Resurrezione, celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection. We offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. And may we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope and Jose our Bishop and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all. We pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Per ipsum et cum ipso et in ipso, est tibi Deo Patri Omnipotenti, in unitate Spiritu Sancti, omnes honor et gloria, Eronia secula seculo. Amen. Now, at the Savior's command, the form by the divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, our Son. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Offer to each other now the sign of the Lord's peace. I have a wife and a musician. Thank you. 
Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to enter my room. But only say the word, and my soul shall be
Let us pray. May your sacraments, O Lord, we pray, perfect in us what lies within them, that what we now celebrate in signs we may one day possess in truth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And finally, uh, continuing and maybe concluding, I don't know, the tradition of the Chaucer Mass celebration will be held in the convent uh, after the Mass. Uh, anybody has, who wishes to come will be invited. There will be refreshments and an opportunity to uh, chat, get to know each other more, and share stories. The Lord be with you. Now may God bless you, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying God by your life. Thanks, Thanks God. God. And please join with us in singing our closing song, Stella Splendid. Please join with us. Oh, <laughs> oh,